Ave Maria. John the Baptist gives testimony to our Lord. Not once, but frequently. He gave testimony to our Lord when the crowds came down to the Jordan to be baptized by him. He gave testimony when the um, scribes and the Pharisees sent priests from Jerusalem to ask John who he was. He referred them to Christ. He gave testimony again when our Lord came for baptism. He gives testimony again where he says, Behold the Lamb of God. This He gives testimony to to the disciples, to the people who were gathered. And from this, we had the disciples who followed our Lord. He gives testimony yet again when his own disciples came, complaining that our Lord was baptizing. So, as we read in the prologue of St. John's Gospel, a man came, sent from God, to give testimony. He was not the light, but he came to give testimony for the light the true light that enlightens all those who come into this world. So, our Lord comes to the Jordan, and we we need to make a distinction between the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospel of John. the, The first three Gospels are concerned, or they take up the thread after the baptism of our Lord. But St. John deals with the period before. So the Lord came to to the Jordan to be baptized. John at first objects to, to this, but to fulfill all righteousness, in particular, that our Lord might be identified with sinners, though he was not a sinner, John baptized him. In this baptism, the waters are now given the power, or better still, the Holy Spirit would now use the, um, the, the waters as a means by which to transmit His grace, or basically for us to be reborn. So in our Lord's submersion in the water, the human nature, the old Adam, is buried. And by His coming up, the new Adam is made manifest. So we also, when we are baptized, as St. Paul tells us, we are baptized into the death of the Lord. So the the Lord um, is baptized, and we're told by the first three evangelists, he was led by the Spirit, specifically by the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So indeed, the Spirit, God, does lead us into temptation as As um, we we read, Christ was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. We, however, know that God will not permit us to be tempted beyond our strength. And therefore, constantly, we have to depend on this Holy Spirit. After his fasting in the wilderness and the temptation, our Lord now returns to the Jordan, and this is where St. John the Evangelist takes it up. He comes back so as to, one, correct any misunderstandings that might have occurred because he had been baptized, and therefore it may be thought that he was a sinner and he's been baptized um, for his own sins. But also, he came back to the Jordan so that John may once again testify to him. And in this testimony, make even more clear what our Lord's purpose was. Why did he come into the world? Well, we know he came into the world to free all those who had fallen under the power of the devil. So he comes, so we're told, at that time John saw Jesus come in towards him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins, the sin of the world. So John gives a testimony. He declares him to be the Lamb. He declares his purpose to take away the sins of the world. He refers to him in 
mentioning or hinting at his divine origin. This is the one. This is the man that comes who is preferred before me, because he was before me. So he is speaking of his pre-existence or hinting at it. He goes on to say that, that John is referring to himself now that he is an impartial witness. I did not know him. So it's not out of friendship or relationship that I'm saying this. I did not know him, but I came that he may that he, that he may be manifest um, to Israel. So John gave testimony, and he goes further and says, "I saw the Spirit come down as a dove from heaven and remain on him." So he's indicating that he's chosen by heaven, and then he says that I bear testimony that this is the Son of God. So he's again pro proclaiming the divinity of our Lord. So then, he if we go back, Behold the Lamb of God. Immediately, the Jewish minds would go back to the Old Testament, to several things in the Old Testament. First of all, the the Abraham asked by his son Isaac, where is the lamb? God himself will provide the lamb, said the patriarch. So this is the lamb that the Israelites were waiting for for centuries and centuries. The prophet Isaiah, likewise, like a lamb he was before his sharers, not uttering a word, or Jeremiah, or Moses, who established who through whose ministry the sacrifices of the temple were established. What sacrifices? Well, there were five animals that were offered in sacrifice. There was, first of all, the heifer and the goat. And then there was the sheep and the two birds, the pigeon and the turtle dove. But the sheep were divided into three categories. There was the ram, the, then there was the ewe, and then there was the lamb itself. The lamb was sacrificed twice daily, in the morning and in the evening, and the others were added for various festivals or for various needs. So the lamb was the principal sacrifice, offered in the morning, the morning sacrifice, offered in the evening, the evening sacrifice, in the morning that we might be able to petition God for our needs in the evening in thanksgiving or in the morning is the beginning of our salvation at the end the evening for the end which is our glorification or again it could be the beginning Christ is the beginning and Christ is the end so in all of these ways in proclaiming him to be the Lamb of God St. John brings our minds back to the purpose of God which is our salvation or, as St. Paul says, that God was redeeming us in Christ. So the, the evangelists, the, the Baptist, points him out. Behold him that takes away the sin of the world. He's taken it away, not once, but always, continually. And again, we, we see, when we read the Apocalypse, we see St. John again, St. John, John the Evangelist, referring to the Lamb as if slain from the foundation of the world. And the Baptist continues, This is he of whom I said, After me there comes a man who is preferred before me, because he was before me, and I knew him not. But I came baptizing to make him manifest to Israel. Or I came baptizing, calling for repentance, so that all those who desired salvation would come. And so John's baptism was one in preparation for that of Christ. John gave testimony, we told him. I saw the Spirit coming down as a dove from heaven, and he remained upon him. So the, the Spirit comes down as a dove, indicative of peace, even as the, the dove left the ark and returned with the olive branch. So also the Spirit, in the form of a dove, comes down, offering us reconciliation with the Father. But we're told he remained on Christ. He didn't depart from him. <clears throat> and this is an indication, again, of our Lord's divinity. Because where 
can the spirit find rest except in one like himself, in a nature equal to his own? And he remains. The spirit does not remain with us. We receive the spirit. He comes down to us. He remains only in those gifts that are necessary for our salvation, for our holiness, for our sanctification, namely faith. For it's impossible to please God without faith. He remains with us a gift of hope. And of course, charity, because charity covers a multitude of sins. He's there in the gifts of humility, for it is not possible to approach God without humility, and so on. All of these are graces, gifts that are necessary for our holiness, for our sanctification, for our salvation. But the other gifts, such as that of prophecy, for instance, or the speaking of tongues, these other gifts are not necessary for our salvation. They're not necessary for our holiness. And they are received as, as appropriate and as needed. For these are gifts necessary for the salvation or for the sanctification or for the inspiration of others. And so we find, in, as an example, that the prophets um, spoke only as necessary and there were things hidden from them. And that applies to the spirits of the old, te- to the prophets of the Old Testament, as well as those of the New. But in the case of our Lord, the Spirit remains, and so He has the fullness of grace. He is never lacking the presence of the Holy Spirit. And again, the the, the Baptist says, "I knew Him not." So I'm not speaking out of favoritism, but rather He, upon he who sent me to baptize said, He upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him. He is the one that baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and I gave testimony that this is the Son of God. So our Lord baptizes not with water, but with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit himself. And who can baptize with the Spirit of God except he who is God? And therefore the baptism gives that final testimony. This is the Son of God. And so as our Lord is baptized, and we commemorate it on this, the octave day of the Epiphany, we ask that the Holy Spirit might indeed descend on us and remain with us in those gifts that are so necessary for us to grow in holiness and in peace and in grace. And in the Spirit of God Himself. In Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Santa Maria.